Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm Spartan. And I'm Pudgy. And we are back with more Game of Thrones. As we have finished season three, which was a very heavy hitter, we are now going to watch the season three histories and lore video, which we yep. have always done at the end of each season, almost as a way of recapping that season, getting a bit of extra info. Usually we learn a bit and it's almost, I'd say it's probably even a bit more book accurate in the sense that we're getting it from the perspective of different people, which is what we've been told, how the books are told. Yeah. So I do like that. I do like how we hear different voices telling different stories and the same story in like a different perspective. It's almost like a nice little recap as well, the ability to digest all the little bits and pick up on things we might have missed and it sort of prepares us for the next season. So we like yeah. it as a bit of a bridge between the seasons also serving as a really good time to digest our emotions because season three was one of the heaviest hitting seasons we've had probably in any show. I had to wear the Stark t-shirt again because I could just not not wear it. Like Yeah, we're wearing it in commemoration of the sacrifice and the tragedy that was done. We're still digesting it. Even editing those episodes was honestly hard. Every time I like went back to like get a screen grab or whatever it was, I would just cry. Yeah. Even like, making so even making the thumbnails was just oh. like hitting him in the fill. So that was a big one. We're hoping season four is going to give us some wins because so far other Lannisters are just stupidly far in front, but yeah. we'll discuss that more in our season four, episode one, where so, we also got to update our love like Haley's in that yeah, video too. Yes. Stay tuned for that because that will- Big changes. Yeah. There's going to be massive changes. But the way we do this is we will go through each section and we will pause and have a little bit of chat after that section. We're needed. Yeah. Unless we got nothing to say, but if anything was particularly memorable, then we'll chat about it. Yeah, between. Give you guys a disclaimer. An hour of constant talking always tests my attention span. <laughs> I've got my coffee to help me. I do I do genuinely enjoy these, but it's, it's a, a lot, lot of info in one hour. It's very dense, like it, a lot of information. Yeah, and because you gotta go, I've gotta go at the pace at which it's given to me, and I'm trying to keep up with everyone's everything. So maybe I'll get better at them the more familiar I get with Game of Thrones lore, but if you see my eyes sort of like rolling back into my skull, <laughs> you know what's going on. And yeah, to help with my memory, I've just got like a little book writing everything down that I find interesting anyways. As always, guys, a huge thank you to all the Patreon supporters. The support lately has been incredible, especially after episode nine. It was <laughs> mind-blowing. So we're super grateful for all of that. Thank you so much, guys. It helps us out a lot in providing content for the channel and allocating the time it takes to make everything. If you are interested in supporting us over on Patreon, check out the link in our description. We do have early access to upcoming reactions as well as uncut reactions. For everyone over on YouTube, again, a big thank you for all the support we've been receiving lately. It's been amazing. If you enjoyed today's reaction, remember to leave a like. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already because we've still got so much more on this journey to do and we're looking forward to the second half of it. I know, I can't believe how much we've got left. Actually, more than the second half of it. And let us know in the comments down below what you thought, whether you'd watched this history of law before. A lot of people actually come to our reaction and saying they've never seen it before and it was sort of the first time watching it through our eyes and together. So that's always a bit of fun too. So if it was, let us know what you thought of it. Did you learn anything new from it? Okay, let's go. Let's start this shindig. I'm going to turn my brain on. <laughs> All right, starting off is Robert's Rebellion by Peter Baelish and Varys. This is going to be a really interesting take. <laughs> You just know it's going to be different. Those two always crack me up. You know what would be funny? If, like, during their storytelling, they're, like, fighting about, like, the perspective. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Or, like, undermine each other. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go. And this is the first one that they've done in full HD, 1080p yep. quality. So, it might be a bit better. We'll see how it's progressed. Yep. For 300 years, the Targaryen dynasty ruled Westeros. Wars were still time. fought, homes still burned, and men still died. But compared to the chaos of what came before, the realm was stable. And boring. The Targaryens lied, I knew it. thieved, and killed as much as other lords. Such, such, they such just a had dragons to answer all complaints. Until they didn't. When the last dragon died, it was only a matter of time before the Targaryens followed. By only, you mean another century? Which they oh my wasted God, trying it. to replace their lost advantage. Incinerating it's their own palaces to them. hatch dragon eggs, drinking wildfire to become dragons, and let's not forget the Mad King's favorite, burning men Warfare. alive so he could pretend to be Holy a dragon. Shit. We urged Aerys to pardon Brandon Stark. 
The boy had threatened Prince Rhaegar, but Rhaegar had stolen the boy's sister. And the boy was the eldest son of our Warden of the North. Who's the greater fool? A mad king or the man who reasons with him? Ares <laughs> saw knives in every shadow. When you told him to treat the Starks with caution, you made him afraid. And what he feared, he Interesting. Killed. I wouldn't have thought you of all people would bother with recriminations for Brandon's death, Lord Baelish. Not after your, shall we call it, duel with him? <laughs> Brandon was as arrogant as he was stupid. Oh yeah, I forgot about like that. His father, yeah, he was one that won Catelyn's heart. Answered Ares' summon to the capital. They earned their fates. But the younger son, Ned, what was his crime? That Ares ordered his death as well. Unlike men, mm. families don't die when you lop off their head. At the very least, so you should have pointed out that loyal and dutiful Ned was living with John Arryn, a proud and over-righteous lord with an impregnable castle and no sons of his own. Perhaps you could have spared Ares the embarrassment of revolt. If only we'd had the foresight to consult you, Lord Baelish, but I suppose first we'd have had to know who you were. I love it. Nobody knew Robert Baratheon either, yet he claimed the right to sit on the Iron Throne. Damn. He had Targaryen blood. Our boy Robert. His mother. A pretty dress for an ugly truth. Through his mother. War, he had Targaryen blood. swing a hammer harder than the other options. When did you know you'd lost, Lord Varys? When Robert Baratheon killed Prince Rhaegar on the Trident. Wrong. Mm. You lost the war when you let Ned Stark slip back into the north. Neither the bloody gate of the Vale or Mote Caelan in the north have ever fallen. They could have held out for years, even if you'd killed Robert. Would you let him slip through your fingers as well? I told the court that Robert was hiding in the Stony Sept, but the hand of the king wasted too much time searching the city. That's Something about the glory of single combat. Then Ned Stark's army arrived to save the day. Too bad I love Lord a Tywin was series in that man. Longer. He would have simply raised the town and been done with it. Perhaps. And perhaps the rebels would have found even more of the countryside flocking to their banners. I'd almost forgotten. You weren't always so loyal to the Lannisters during the war, were you? I did Ooh. my duty to the realm. He always yeah. says when Lord that. Tywin showed like up at King's that. Landing, professing loyalty, I warned Aerys not to open the gates. Prince Rhaegar was dead, our army scattered. The lion does not stir unless he smells meat. Mm -hmm. I admire your powers of persuasion, Lord Varys. Few could traffic in so many secrets to so little avail. Grand Maester Pycelle told Ares what he wanted to hear, that his Snake. old Snake Tywin was there to save him. Then Ares' old friend sacked the city, and his son stabbed Ares in the back. A regrettable, though necessary action. As yeah, were the pardons the new King Robert bestowed on the royalists, Mace Tyrell, Barristan Selmy, you. King Robert wisely chose order over vengeance. John Arryn wisely chose for Robert, but John Arryn died. Then Robert, yeah, then true. Ned. So Damn. ended a glorious revolution. Oh man, that's and sad. Westeros has been burning ever since. Let yeah. it. How Targaryen of you. Let it. One of the Baelish. Fire Chaos turns and even the proudest speech. oaks to ash, leaving newer roots space to climb. That's so funny. I actually really, really enjoyed that one. It was awesome. Having the two of them there is pretty cool. It was great. The, just the way they like heckle each other as they speak is just a great dynamic. I mean, when I saw their names together, I was hoping that it would be that, but that was just like... You know, my little hope, like, I didn't think it would actually come to life. That's actually so, so good. I hope we get maybe a more of those for other subjects. Yeah, for sure. Um, I found it interesting that, like, people were drinking, like, the dragon fire, thinking they'd the become... wildfire, yeah. Oh, wildfire, that, you know, they'd become dragons. Yeah, so that wouldn't have gone very well. Damn. But I love that line just at the end there where Varys was like... Because um, he was like, oh, you know, Westeros has been burning ever since, and... He, Peter was like, let it. And he's like, Varys, oh my God, Varys' response was like gold. He's like, you sound like one of the Targaryens, the mad ones. Yeah. How Targaryen of you. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how they both sort of recognize that Ares was a mad king and yet 
they were still very loyal to their duties. Mm. And even Varys, particularly, who always serves the realm, he always walks this grey line of moral and immoral. But, you know, it's interesting, mm. his perspectives. You see, he tries to stay very objective. What's news to me, anyway, is they mentioned that Robert was apparently half Targaryen because his mother. Now, I don't know if that's just a figure of a speech or if his mother was actually a Targaryen. But that's interesting. I never heard that before. Mm. Yeah. And definitely sad having Robert, Ned, and the hand. John Aaron, Aaron yeah. yeah. All blacked out. It's like, dude, that's like the end of an era. But that literally, like, summarizes all the events till now. Like, well, I mean, I guess season one, to be fair, because it was John Aaron, Robert, then Ned. Like, how crazy is that when you put it in that sequence? Seeing it like that, though, now with our newfound understanding of Jamie. I do mm. sympathize and feel sorry for Jamie because all Same. these men were, you know, glorified heroes. Even Tywin was a hero. Mm. And yet the one person who was just spat on and disrespected was Jamie. But he was equal with all of them, to be fair, in what he contributed. Well, I do like how Varys said, you know, it had to be done. So yeah. Interesting was- wording by Varys. He goes, uh, what did he say? Something but necessary. Yeah. Um, tr- I don't know, tragic or something like almost like it was bad but necessary you know so that's his half realm speaking it's like half what quote unquote what was an oath breaking thing but then on the other hand necessary so he's very he tries to say very objective it's interesting various perspective yeah whereas peter's like just burn that world down he does not care as long as he can climb up opportunity he's prepared to watch everything burn well chaos is a ladder remember yeah chaos is a damn ladder for peter baelish (sighs) House Reed. So House Reed is the Wargs family. Oh, the really? one that's like with Bran and stuff. And Mira is the sister. Oh, it's oh, it's the, the uh, right. The sister that was fighting with the Usher. wildling. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. So we don't know much about House Reed. That's a good no. memory that you remember that. So I had no <laughs> clue. Yeah. So House Reed by Mira Reed. So this would be interesting. What have they got to say for us? Mud men. Bog devils. Those are just the most pleasant names our fellow northerners have for us, the Cranach men who live in the swamps of the Neck. Because we do not live in castles like them. Because we do not farm like them. Because we are not tall or rich like them. But through our veins flows the same blood of the first men. And at yeah, times, I like that recognition. maybe something more. We still live much as they did on floating islands in houses of thatch and woven reeds. We fish, hunt, and tell our children of our heroes. The knight of the laughing tree who fought in the year of the false spring. The last marsh king who challenged the Starks and lost his crown and his daughter. And other stories. So many backstories I'd love to see series on. the The neck was not always a swamp. In the Dawn Age, it was as dry and fertile as the rest of the North. But during the war with the First Men, the children of the forest brought down the hammer of waters on the neck, trying to break Westeros in two. When the waters finally receded, they left the bogs and swamps we know today. Yeah. Many of the First Men decided to fight on, but my ancestors wisely chose to heed the children's power and advance no farther. They beat their swords into frog spears and fish hooks and settled a land forever devastated by the folly of war. I do respect Unlike that, the rest you know. Of Westeros, we keep no garrisons and raise no soldiers for petty spats with our neighbours. Our land protects its own. An outsider will find in the neck an endless morass of suck holes, quicksands, and green grass that looks solid to the unwary eye, but turns to water the instant you tread on it. <laughs> if you're lucky yeah, enough to right, be honest, you'll only drown inside your own steel. They've learned the harsh environment is better. Not, you get to meet what swims in that water. <sighs> Serpents and monstrous lizard lions with Damn. teeth like daggers and never enough to eat. Don't worry. Only your horse will live long enough to feel their poisons burning through it. Oh, if you somehow survive shit. all this, you may find that a well-placed dart can be as deadly as any blade. Not that you'll see us blowing it your way. Since the fall of the last <laughs> March King, House Reed has ruled the neck beneath the banner of a black lizard lion on a grey-green field. We are not wealthy, powerful, or known even to our own countrymen. Our home, okay. Greywater Watch, 
is no castle you've ever seen. And seeing it once does not mean you'll ever find it again. For grey water oh. watch moves. Many would-be conquerors have died trying to find us. With war wow. all around and our Stark Lord besieged on all sides, many more will doubtless soon try. They will look at us on a map and see a stranglehold for the north. And they will forget that the sea itself once entered the neck, and not all of it returned. Interesting. I mean, I feel like that's the most information out of all of season three that we've even gotten on the Reed family. Yeah, it's completely new. Like, I don't, there's not much on that in the season. Yeah. A lot of that's very new, a lot more. I mean, maybe we missed a little bits and pieces, but I think most of that was new. I think so too. I found it interesting that, that what was it? The Greywater Watch moves. I don't know necessarily what that means, if that's like some metaphor as well, or like- Well, there's some sort of magical properties of their land and it somehow rotates. I well, know. I honestly wouldn't even put it past them because I mean, I forget the boy's name, Jojen, I think, or something like that, is a walk, and that's some magical- We've got magical... walls, we've got white walkers, like yeah. dragons. We're yeah. not going to underestimate the land's potential to have magic, yeah. Yeah. 100%. I don't think I have too much to say on that. That was just new information. Yeah. I'd be curious I... to maybe if we get to meet more of the family later on, we'll see. It is interesting how, you know, there's all these main families that everyone knows about, but then there's also, like, little ones that- they're just like, yeah, whatever. Like, let, let them let them be, leave them be, like... But there might be more to them that beats the eye, you know? Yeah. Sort of like they're going under the radar. They might not have the glory on the surface, but they might play a pivotal role. Well, I think it's also like, you know, what they don't understand, they fear. And that's why they're going to attack it and stuff. I mean, the magical properties of this family, the Reed family, you know, the whole of Westeros doesn't want that to come to light, especially because who knows, that could, you know unbalance everything for them. I don't even know how to pronounce this one. Old Gis and Slaver's okay, Bay name. by Jorah Mormont. Now, I don't know what that we is. do know the difference between Jorah and Joa. People <laughs> don't understand Australian accents. We do know the difference. So we Jorah just sound similar, especially when Pudgy says it because her R's are like next level. <laughs> so this is Jorah, Danny's right hand man, who Queen's guard, I think they're named. So I themselves. just heard it then. Like I do the way, I don't know if I said the same, but the way you sort of skim over the R, it almost sounds like Jorah. Like you say, you Jorah. Say, yeah, but then you pronounce the R. Whereas normally it's like Jorah, and it sounds Jorah. like Jorah. Like you almost, the R just rolls off the way we say it. Jorah. Yeah, it's easy to miss. So I get how people can miss it. Because when you said it, I'm like, oh, if I really pay attention. So, hey, wait. Jorah? Jorah. But see how it's, whereas we don't we don't sound our R's as much to say Jorah. Like yeah, we, we don't go. We don't really how go. Do, how do Americans do it? Jorah. Jorah. Jor Jorah. Jorah? No, that's such an Aussie accent. <laughs> Honestly, Jor Jor is like American. Jor. Jor. No, no, not Jor, because that's, that's a different word. No, that's no. I'm talking about the other one. Not anyway, <laughs> we're working on accents. We're working on accents. We understand a little bit, but we do know who Jorah is. Yeah. Okay. So I don't even know what this is about, to be fair, but I guess we'll- Slaver's Bay, maybe it's going to do with the Unsullied and stuff. I don't know. We'll find out. Valyria was not the first to conquer the world. In the dawn of days, the city of Geese opened its gates and poured forth its legions across the continent of Essos. With their lockstep discipline and absolute obedience, they ground entire nations beneath their boots and planted the harpy in every corner of the known yeah. world. So this is even before the Valerian reign, like, holy they crap. Chained. Slavery is as old as man, but until the Giscari, it was never an art. Terrible. The slave lords grew rich and fat as pyramids were raised around them, pleasure houses were filled, and fighting pits were opened. And Asos, Nobody they're not remembers Westeros. if the waters yeah. around Geese had names before the Empire, but ever since, we know them only as Slaver's Bay. And the Gulf okay. of Grief. This also is where the Unsullied were anyway. Of Geese, so. however, Looks like it. nothing right. remains but ruins. Where end all great civilizations. 5,000 years ago, Valyrian shepherds stumbled on strange eggs. And within a few generations, an upstart Valyrian freehold rose across the sea. Five times did the Giscari contend with Valyria. And five times wow. did they go down in defeat. For the Damn, yeah, you're not going to do much against that. And the Empire had none. The best of their legions burned, 
the others broke. The brick walls of Geese were pulled down, the streets and buildings turned to ash, and the wow. very The dragons were an absolute clutch fine for the Valerians. Skulls. Yet the Empire was not wholly destroyed. Astapor, Yunkai, and Marine, once okay, early colonies along Slaver's Bay, survived and even thrived. Valyria had watched the Giscari grow rich and powerful off the backs of conquered peoples, and now the self-styled Freehold wanted its turn. While the Dragon Lords brought the world to heel, the slave markets of their former enemy never lacked for flesh. Lamenting the lost empire, the descendants of old geese grew rich and fat. The doom fell on Valyria, and the Dothraki rose to pillage most of the continent at will. But gold-laden mm. Astapor, Yunkai, and Marine continue as they have for thousands of years. Okay, wow, well, so those were the three. For even the horse lords understand what the Giscari taught Valyria so long ago. What good are slaves without slavers? Yeah, that's true. true. So essentially, it the Dothraki are like a massive part in of Essos. Then, so they sort of formed after that slave trader period. They yeah. sort of their own warrior race, almost, almost like a primitive warrior race. Yeah. Yeah, from what I understand. Then we have Yunkai, Marine, and Astapor. Others like three major cities that remain or, from that previous slave trading period yeah. in, in Essos. So interesting. Which one was that Astapor that Yunkai was the recent one. Astapor was the first one. Yeah. Was that where we met the yeah. guy? Antalid and yeah. No. What was the one before that? Um, and it had that big castle. What was that called? Do you remember? Oh, that wasn't those three. Yeah. yeah. I, um, so I wonder where that comes into it. That was just a, a separate city. Yeah. That one of the one of the maybe one of the seven free cities. I can't remember if it was included in that. But yeah, that was separate. I can't remember the name right now. Okay, interesting. I feel like we're getting a lot of background information on lots of different things that we haven't really heard of before. Because the first two histories and lore was a like pretty much the same story, like Robert's Rebellion and things like that, just in lots of different perspectives. But mm. yeah. hearing all this stuff definitely makes me like want to one day read the books. Mm. Um, but it also makes me because I know the books cover a lot more, but that's still Game of Thrones eight seasons or so. I mean, they're not finished, but. Yeah, and then they've got House of the Dragons prequels. I mean, holy crap, the world is huge. I see why people get so invested in it because there's just so much lore. You can literally lose so much in like the, of, of your energy in this world just trying to oh. find, figure it all out. Like, a For lot. sure, but it's a beautiful world. <laughs> beautiful, but also... Well, yeah, use that word sparingly. You know, crazy. Rest in peace, Rob. I know, I know. All right, so this is The Unstullied, the Unstullied by, by Jorah. Jorah. <laughs> the man's back with more. When the doom claimed Valyria, the great freehold fractured into warring cities and upstart nations, ripe for the taking. Out of the east swarmed the Dothraki, the horse lords of the plains who feared only defeat and dragons. So from the doom. And now the dragons okay. were all gone. Under the great Karl Temu, they sacked and burnt every town and city in their path. No army could stand against them, because the Dothraki do not stand. The horse lords do not draw up battle lines Damn. or hide behind shield walls That's how they all or lay themselves them. in armor. The Dothraki charge. Their blades are more scythe than sword, the better to cull the infantry ranks without breaking stride. Even their archers fire from horseback so that advancing or retreating, the arrows never cease. To the Dothraki, a man who does not ride is no man at all without honor or pride. When the city of Kohor realized Kal was Kohor. coming, they strengthened their walls, doubled their own guards, the one you're of. and hired two full companies of sellswords. The Dothraki were used to glorified farmers with spears. Oh, no. Kohor would nice show stuff. them a proper army, with mounted and armored cavalry to match the horde's own. As an afterthought, the city leaders sent an envoy to Astapor to buy Unsullied. The slavers had always okay. claimed that the Unsullied were the great Giscari legions come again. Few cared. The dragon-burned ruins of Old Geese were a stark reminder that the age of the foot soldier was over. The envoy had his orders, however, and quickly bought 3,000 Unsullied for the long march back. 
for unsullied damn. do not ride. But while they marched, ride, Carl wow. Temu arrived at Quo Hall. I can imagine how pleased the Carl was to finally face a challenge. By the end of the battle, crows and wolves feasted on what remained of Quo Hall's heavy horse. All the cell swords had fled. Quohor knew that the Dothraki would very soon break through the gates to rape, slave, and burn at their pleasure. So now that Danny needs the Dothraki, the not day, the Unsullied. Carl Temo woke to find, before the gates, 3,000 eunuchs in formation, armed with only spears, shields, and spiked helms. I wonder if she the will Unsullied get back had slipped them. past the Carl's army in the night while the Dothraki feasted. Carl Temo had many times their number and could easily have flanked the small force. But to the Dothraki, men on foot are fit only to be ridden down. Eighteen Damn. times the horse lords charged, and eighteen times the Unsullied locked their shields, lowered their spears, and held the line against twenty thousand Dothraki oh. Damn, dude, that's a Spartan effort there. When the Carl's archers rained arrows on them, the Unsullied lifted their shields above their heads until the squall passed. Yeah, that is a three hundred Spartan effort right the there. I respect that. In the Held end, the only 600 the Unsullied remained, but more than 12,000 Dothraki lay dead, including wow. Carl Temo and all his sons. Damn! The new Carl led the survivors past the city gates, where one Holy by one, crap, each man cut off his braid and threw it down before the feet of the Unsullied. Defeated and shamed forever. Yeah, because the braids is there. Since that yeah. day, the Unsullied fill the ranks wow. of cities and households wealthy enough or desperate enough. Cell swords fight for gold, knights for glory, and Dothraki for blood. To a man, the Unsullied, the unsullied fight only to obey. With the right master over them, imagine how the forces of chaos would break against their shields. Our girl the Dunny. The madmen. The usurpers. Wow. You realize what we basically just got told that these guys are essentially far superior to the Dothraki and remember how Robert was like if the Dothraki invade we're gonna lose yeah. and now we're talking about Danny who has all the Unsullied well a lot and can get many more like dude she's building an army of ridiculous this is crazy wow I didn't realize the Unsullied but that's cool I mean that story there as a guy who you know you guys might not have guessed I love Spartans <laughs> And that is a very 300 Spartan like kind of response <laughs> and defiance in, in what they did. So that, that puts a soft spot in my heart for the Unsullied. Such a good movie though, if you guys have seen 300 Spartans. Oh, dude. And the actress who plays Cersei in this is Leonidas' Leonidas's wife, wife. Who we actually loved. And now it's conflict of interest because we love her in 300 it's and hate bit. her in this. It's, Game of Thrones. It's tainted in this, but what a fantastic actress because the fact that we can love her in one movie and then hate her in a series, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So that was interesting with the Unsullied. Lots of lots of interesting stuff there. So I'm pretty sure it is Cohort. No, it's not. I, honestly, I can remember the... I'll just look it up because it's obviously eating you up. Yeah, it's eating me alive. So it's not Cohort, it's Calf. It's calf, yeah. Okay. I knew, dude. I know when I might know the name, no, but I no. know if I hear it's familiar. So when yeah. you were getting caught over these random words, I'm like, what are you doing, man? No, no. I just, I remember Cohort on the map and stuff like that. Yeah, it's Calf. Have we even seen it on the map? Yeah, yeah, we have. It's fine. Well, yeah, it's Calf. So it's yeah, Calf okay. is really separate from it all. Okay, so that, I'm just trying to like grasp everything so I understand the world a bit better. All right, cool. Yeah, and so the Dothraki... Yeah, they came after, what do they call her when the Targaryen... The Doom. Yeah, the Black Doom or something they call it. Yeah, the Doom. Whatever it was. Yeah, that's where the, yeah. the Thraki apparently started to rise a bit. Oh, damn. Oh, you know what? That, oh, the only thing I could think of throughout that is that I remember in season one when we were so hyped thinking that the big build-up was going to be between the Dothraki people and the West Westeros, well, the King's Landing. So naive. And now it's like, dude, that battle seems like such a small oh. element of it all. Like, it's like, holy crap, how much bigger it all got. Mate, those White Walkers are on their way. Interesting. Oh. So this one, Wargs and the Sight by Bran Stark. Probably a good one too, to be honest, because yeah. we know a bit. We know Bran apparently is one of the first or only ones to be able to do uh, take over a human mind, yeah. which he did with Hordor. But... Nonetheless, they're still a bit of a supernatural kind of being. So we'll learn more about them. Yeah. Growing up, my sister Sansa loved stories with princesses and knights. 
But I always <laughs> wanted to be scared. We know. When my turn came, From Gran. I would ask old Nan to tell us of magic and monsters. Long ago, when the world was new, the children of the forest sang the song of the earth, and the earth listened. Magic was strong in those days, and the children could commune with all the beasts of the forest, streams and air. The greatest of them could even leave their bodies to hunt, swim and fly in the skins of animals. Right. So they used to do initially they were the first walks. Then right. so now the children first of the forest were walks with fire and sword. They burned the weirwoods and cut down the children. Calling on dark magic, the children raised the sea and shattered the land bridge that the first men had crossed into dawn. When that wow. failed, the children brought down the hammer of waters upon the neck, flooding and transforming it into the bog it is today. After peace came, the two races shared the land and the children's peace. gods for thousands yeah, of years. Now comes the good part. Nobody knows how or why, but the magic of the children began to emerge in men. Maybe one child in a thousand would be born a warg. Fewer still would be born with the sight. Old Nan would not speak of it, and Maester Lewin never believed in it. But with it, oh, the children them could know of events far away and even those still to come. Some say the sight was the children's most powerful and terrible secret and helped turn mm. the tide during the long night. Magic has since fled our world. Among the small folk, any child suspected of being a war will be left out to die. Beyond the wall, though, wow. a careless hunter might still find his prey, his claws and teeth, and a man's mind to guide them. For the wildlings have a different idea of monsters. Yeah. But yeah, even very wildlings different. keep their distance from a warg. Because, and here, old Nan would lean in close and whisper, how can you tell if the man is wearing the beast, or the beast is wearing the man? Damn, that does shake up a little now, bit, doesn't it? old Nan has no more tales, and Maester Lewin will never scoff again. That's fine. I don't like the scary oh. stories anymore. Because I'm in one. Yeah, wow, that hits hard. Brand. That line hits hard, dude. I was waiting for him to say that. I don't like scary stories anymore because I'm in one. It's <laughs> making me a bit emotional. Yeah, he doesn't even know about Rob and stuff yet. Damn, dude. <sighs> so, the sight is different to wargs. So, you don't... Just because you're a warg doesn't necessarily mean you, you have the sight. I still don't fully understand that. No, because like, we haven't really seen an example of one that's not considered a warg, so... Because mm. people were initially telling us in the comments, I don't know if it was just to mislead us, but Bran's not a warg when we said he was, but then we would find out confirmation he was. He stated to be a warg in season three, so I don't know. I don't know. Interesting. But yeah, he's right. Like, is the beast... What was it? The beast wearing the man or the man, man wearing, wearing the, the beast? beast? Yes, it's interesting. Damn. And we've heard about the children of the forest before as well. Yeah. So it's good to hear mention of them again, even though they're sort of this elusive, mysterious past. Yeah, and... I mean, we're hearing them from, like, a different perspective now, like, on how, you know, like, those magical properties ended up being, like, wargs and things like that. So, yeah, crazy. Now we've got House Bolton. Uh, now this house, it's in the bad books. After what happened in episode nine. I don't know if I want to listen to him. Oh, dude. I don't so, is that his first name? Voice. is Roos yeah. Bolton. I don't want to hear his voice. Don't want to hear his voice at all. <sighs> Look, we did have our mods... Sudden in particular, Sudden Impulse, I'm sure everyone knows him in the comments, did explain some good points that helped me understand where Rob went wrong. And one of them was that I remember there were multiple times where Bolton would try and discuss battle plans yeah. and Rob would sort of wave him away so he could have a long time with Talissa. And I understand that as somebody who is, you know, which side am I, is going to keep my, my house alive, while well, Rob sort of slipped up then and, and made himself look like it yeah. wasn't his poor coin for it. So... I'm not justifying Bolton, and he still pisses me off a fair bit. But I, once I was explaining that, I was like, "Yeah, true. Rob did was getting too carried away, you know, giving a pretty poor impression of is his head screwed on why what are his priorities, and that cost him loyalty." And I, and I understand that. I do get it. I do get it. I just don't like it. And 
didn't have to go that way. Like, I don't know. I get this world is brutal and you've got to do what you need to survive. Um, yeah. Look, if you're dismissing, yeah. if you've got thousands of men yeah. laying down their lives, leaving their home, their wife, their children to fight for your cause, and then you're saying, look, we'll discuss battle plans at a later date so I can have a bit of extra sex with, you know, my oath-broken wife... I mean, you're really setting up a pretty poor image of yourself. So Just stop tainting t- Rob's image. No, look, I love Rob. I love Rob. But I, I, I've had to analyze it, yeah. sit down and think about it and see it in a, lot, a much more For sure. objective light. It's, it's honestly helped me deal with the grief because it's horrendous what's happened. But at least being able to understand where he went wrong, yeah. like where I understood where Ned went wrong, it didn't make it seem as just a completely just wrong yeah. written scenario. Yeah. So, okay, it's sort of there were mistakes made that led to this. Mm. All right, let's hear from this trader. Mr. Bolton. (laughs) Like the Starks, the blood of House Bolton runs back to the first men. Singers call those times the Age of Heroes, a mask for a savage world that bred savage men. Ooh, interesting time. The Lannisters swindled their enemies, the Storm Kings hammered them, and the Starks cut off their heads. In such company as this, were the Boltons really so indelicate? That reminds me of Theon. Unlike some other houses, my ancestors owned the Bolton words. Our blades are sharp. They passed down not a Valerian greatsword, but a knife, honed and thin enough to fit between the topmost layer of skin and the tissue below, and peel. Wow, they they like like sword jar. A naked man has few secrets, a flayed man, none. In those dark days, they say that some of my more willful forebearers would even wear their enemies' skins as cloaks. But no such tokens remain, if they ever existed. Thank God. Certainly hanging in some secret room in the Dreadfort, as old wives and fools insist. I suspect my house itself was responsible for spreading such rumors in the first place. Few weapons are as effective as terror, and this was an age of war. House against house, brother against brother. The Iron Men were on the rise, and never far from our shores. We must have seemed ripe for the taking. Too busy fighting each other to deal with the raiders as they deserved. Thus, the Starks took it upon themselves to unify the North. Under them, um, they drove the pirates they get paid out back? of White Knife and claimed the eastern coast and married the Marsh King's daughter for the neck. A Stark wrestled for Bear Island and won. Or so they say. Silly stories. Blood and Steel won the North, and the Starks had the most of both. After years of war, my ancestors gave up their barbaric practices and bent the knee to their new kings. Thus House Bolton became what we are today. Loyal bannermen and staunch ally to the Starks. Don't use the word loyal. And the second greatest house in the north. Yeah, so yeah, that would be second place. He emphasized, but the, even then his tone there, loyal bannermen, it was like a condescending thing. He's saying that's all we, all we are, just bannermen. He wanted to be more and yeah. then emphasizing second he's like they just he got sick of being second place so then the minute the leader shows weakness which we sort of seen in, in, in the Dothraki the minute you think your leader's not gonna you know we sort of it's a theme we've seen everywhere, everywhere here in the Game of Thrones the way it's played is the minute a leader is not seen as mm. being able to take somebody to greatness they are thrown to the wayside it's what yeah. happened to Ned he wasn't prepared to play the Game of Thrones and so Bailey Shinian sided with Joffrey when he would have actually given Ned his men you know and we've seen it time and time again when a leader is not absolutely driven to play the Game of Thrones as their first priority, then the people generally don't follow, which is why I guess Danny is, at the moment, has nothing else to lose. She's playing that, which is why I think she can go a long way. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like, I just think that that's going to be thrown to the waste as well. I mean, Melisandre literally said it when she looked into the fire. The, yeah. you know, the wall between kings is useless. It means nothing. Yeah. Though whatever's beyond the wall is coming for everyone in Westeros. I think we've still got a couple seasons of that 
building up beneath the yeah, surface and yeah. I think so. Um, so that knife that they passed down, what's the bastard son's name? Is it Reese or something? Mm, no. I don't remember. It's not Reese. No, I can't remember, but is that the knife that was passed down and then he's using that to cut off Theon's? Nah, because he didn't oh. cut it off. Someone else, his guards cut it off and we've seen him have a normal knife. The knife they showed there was a very unique yeah. point. I don't think we've seen it. If we did, we've missed it. But okay. But it did sort of emphasize, it seems like a Bolton, House Bolton sort of tactic, which is very much about torture and fear. So mm. uh, so that obviously underpins Bolton's bastard son's approach to what he's doing to Theon. But I found that interesting. I don't remember the first two, but when they said like the Starks cut off their heads, they've literally got the wolf head as their sigil. And then um, the flayed man that's what theon is right now that flayed man like on that cross arms and legs spread out and that's the sigil of the boltons so it's almost like their their torture tactic or or like their punishment is their sigil like represented within their sigil somehow yeah yep i like i love how the starks have the wolf because wolves travel in packs and they respect their alpha and they're sort of like a very loyal to each other, you know, and they mm. in groups. And I feel like that underpins the Starks. But sometimes their loyalty can can lead them to, you know, yeah, to death. Whereas the Lion is very much... Lion also has elements of that, but it's a bit more of a lone hierarchical thing. There's one at the top and everyone sort of serves and it's not as much about equality, which you can sort of see with the Lannisters. You're very much at the top or you're here. Mm. All right. The Stormlands by Brienne. Okay, interesting. So we're going to learn a bit Tuff. Brienne. Now the Stormlands. Stormlands is-, is Robert Baratheon and stuff. Like, he's from the Stormlands. That the Baratheons, right. Because mm-hmm. I'm thinking of, they took it from the previous people. I can't remember what they were called. Remember the story of the Stormlands were initially something before the Baratheons took over? I'm, I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure there were people there before in the original era. And then the maybe. Baratheons took over. When they, when they were saying the origins of the Stormlands, that's in maybe Histories and Lore. Season two, I think. Mm. Yeah, okay. Tarth has lulled many a novice sailor into complacency. Our lush island sits on calm blue water like an emerald set into a sapphire. You would mm. never guess that such a vision is only the sheath hiding the blade of Shipbreaker Bay, with its treacherous tides, unpredictable gales, and sharp rocks lurking just below the water's surface. <laughs> the storms that blow through the bay water the Kingswood and Rainwood, two of the great forests of Westeros, and they give the Stormlands their name. Even without our weather, we have more than earned our name in strife. The first Storm King, Durham, started his reign by declaring war on the gods themselves. He huh, loved the daughter of the start. sea god and the wind goddess, but they forbade the union. Got a bit of a crowd on their wedding, hands. the gods <laughs> unleash their might. Pulling down his hold and killing all of Durin's family and guests, though his wife shielded him. Damn. Durin vowed to rebuild, and when he did, the gods again destroyed his home. His counselors begged him to retreat inland, but he would not abandon his war. Finally, with the counsel of the children of the forest, or perhaps a young Bran the Builder, Durin raised a seventh castle that, try as they might and still do, the wind and sea gods could not tear asunder. What we Darren know today. Took the name God's Grief and called his new home Storm's End. Storm's Having End. beaten the waters to the east, the Storm Kings turned their gaze to more practical enemies the Reach, Riverlands, and Dawn. For thousands of years, the Storm Kings fought the Gardener Kings of the Reach and various families of Dawn for control of the Dornish marches just below the Red Mountains. The fighting didn't stop until Dawn married into the Seven Kingdoms, a mere hundred years ago. But still the houses of the Stormlands, such as the Dondarians, guard the Bone Way, the mountain Dondarian. pass into the marches, against any Dornish incursion. The Storm Kings had greater luck to their north, at first. They took the trident from the, the river sound effects in the back are and built cool an too. empire that stretched as far as the neck. But then the Did Iron Horns swarmed out of their islands and pushed the Storm Kings out of the Riverlands. No doubt the Ironborn intended to expand their empire into the Stormlands. Before they had a chance, Aegon Targaryen landed with his dragons. Damn, While what Aegon time he's spewing. The, kings of the Iron Islands, the Rock and the Reach, his fiercest commander and rumoured bastard brother, Oris Baratheon, set out to subdue the Stormlands. 
Bastard no matter brother. how fierce a warrior yeah, he yeah. was, no one could have envied his task. Storm's end had seen thousands of years of war and never fallen. But Argalak, the Storm King, chose not to barricade himself behind its walls and gave Ori's the battle he must have hoped for. Ori slew Argalak and took Argalak's castle, kingdom, daughter, sigil, and house words. House Baratheon Damn. became the lord of the Stormlands. Okay, Targaryen so that's what yeah. I'm too, yeah. the Stormlands for the most part until Robert rebelled against the Mad King. Mm. His first challenge came not from the crown, but from his own bannermen, who tried to join forces against him. Robert struck first, defeating three so armies in Summerhall. The victory cemented Robert's control of the Stormlands, and he was able to march on the Reach and Riverlands with no enemy to his rear. Yet not all of Robert's bannermen sided with him. Sir Barristan the Bold came from the Stormlands. But as the preeminent member of Aerys Kingsguard and greatest right. knight in the realm, Sir Barristan remained loyal. Right, After like Robert's decisive realm. victory on the Trident, Robert sent his own maester to care for his countryman, Sir Barristan, who had suffered grievous wounds whilst fighting so hard to kill him. Later, when the Kingslayer betrayed Aerys, Robert pardoned Sir Barristan and even took Shit him King's onto his fire. own Kingsguard. When Robert lifted Mace Tyrell's ill-managed siege of Storm's End and returned to his ancestral home, he realized the dream of all the Storm Lords before him, to rule the Seven Kingdoms. Then Robert died, and his brother Stannis killed their other brother, the noble <laughs> King Renly, with black magic. Now the storm really think Stannis is the eldest? Because he appears like an eldest. So many houses burnt on the black water and others currying favour with the Lannisters to seize the survivors' lands. Renly could have saved us. If only I could have saved him. Yeah, damn, that regret. I would teach Stannis a lesson he should have learnt growing up. I don't understand her love for Renly. As lightning gives way to thunder, so too must murder lead to vengeance. Damn. You know Jeez, what they're I just... gonna teach Sanus a lesson, Dan. But you know what I just remember? Because we kind of forgot about Brienne leading to the end of the season. Cat's dead. She was loyal to Cat, and the the the, the Starks. Uh, yeah. So yeah. now she's well, not friends... to the Starks, just to Catelyn. Yeah, yeah. But also, like, a sort of maybe by, by extension, like the Starks a little bit. Maybe not. No, she was very specific. I do not serve the Starks. I know, I know, I that, I know that. I know that. My point being that. Now that she's friends with the Lannisters, who also well, Jamie, and by extension, yeah. you know, I think there's a bit of friendship there, which he's part of the Lannister house. But the conflict of interest is that Jamie's father had Catelyn killed. Uh, again, what happens to Brienne now? Like Brienne's sort of in this no, no man's land again. I think at the end of episode ten, when they kind of looked at each other, I think it was just an acknowledgement of we will be friends, but I know we have different missions. I just don't think that she's. Do you know what I mean? I think she's going to go on her own journey. I don't think she's... I don't know. Yeah. I, I can see her and Jamie having a bit more of an interaction as well. They've been through a lot. Yeah, yeah. Them two, but not necessarily the house. No, no, no. I'm just saying, she, I just forgot about her situation. She's sort of left with nothing as well. Yeah. It's interesting. The Baratheons took everything, like the sigil, like the sisters, the everything. Like, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a fair few bit of history going way back in this one as well like last time it's mm. interesting but yeah that now it kind of makes more sense why jamie you know set to save brienne from getting raped that you know they've got like all the sapphires in the world it was kind of just their seas look like an emerald set in a sapphire or something like that yeah 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 we'd already been explained that i'm pretty sure yeah yeah we knew that that's it it wasn't that we just didn't know why they kind of came up with that i knew that so oh, okay. i'm trying to figure out whether it was a comment or whether a mod or whether it was explained i can't remember but i remember no. not be, knowing that yeah no so this is the veil by peter baelish so it'd be interesting because we actually haven't seen him there yet we know he's on the way to liza aaron and we saw that when um Tyrion was captured yeah but when sansa was looking out at the sea and that was Peter Baelish on his way, so it'll be interesting to see what he says. Impregnable. That's how the Vale sees itself. Shielded from Westeros by its mountains. 
They call the entrance to their land the Bloody Gate because, during the Age of Heroes, a dozen armies supposedly smashed themselves against it. Even if they'd gotten through, the roads of the Vale are narrow, steep, and treacherous. Half the men would have slipped to their deaths, or frozen in the mountain snow. Yeah. Or so the common wisdom goes. Except the Vale has been conquered. Those vaunted mountains didn't stop the Andals who came by the Eastern Sea. The people of the Vale say that Sir Artus Arryn, the Andal general, flew on the back of a giant falcon and slew the Griffin King on top of the tallest falcon. mountain. During Aegon's conquest, one of his sisters did the same. Flying her dragon over the bloody gate and up to the Eyrie, the Arryn stronghold. And the Arryn boy king yielded the Vale in return for a ride on the beast. Do you sense the theme here? The rationalizing of defeats with mythical beasts and the whims of children, instead of acknowledging the root cause. The arrogance of isolation. The men of okay, the Vale are so proud of their mountains. They Hold can't the pins any flaw the journey now. As with the mountains, so too with their blood. The first Andals landed in the Vale, as its most powerful lords, the Arons, the Wainwoods, the Corbrays, like to brag. Through their veins runs the blood of the oldest Andal nobility in Westeros. But through their brains runs an even older folly. That blood matters. If it did, those oh. pureborn lords should have been able to that exterminate the Hill tribe centuries too. ago. But those primitive raiders, whose tribes more resemble kennels than families, continue to plague the Vale, even kidnapping an Aaron once. Until Tyrion Lannister, an outsider, no Vale lord ever thought to turn the tribes to the Vale's advantage. That a desperate warlike people could be useful, not to mention inexpensive. But perhaps yeah, the true. Vale lords consider such thoughts beneath them. After all, the Vale's isolation does breed an abundance of honor and pious bleating, which governs their decisions instead of foresight. Like a blind man who can only guess where his horse is taking him. <laughs> I doubt John Aaron had even prepared for civil war when he raised his banners instead of handing over his young wards, Ned Stark and Robert Baratheon, to the Mad King. Honor demanded, and Lord Aaron obeyed. I think they were his wards. He'd have done the same if the boys hadn't been the lords of two great houses who could field mighty armies of their own. But perhaps I give him too little credit. After all, if the war went against them, only Lord Arryn had a nice, impregnable castle to retreat into, mm. and he was wise enough to take poor Lysa Tully into his bed to win the Riverlands as allies. John Arryn mm. won, then John Arryn died. Yeah, Wisely, damn. the Vale stayed out of all the ensuing chaos. Its crops did not burn or wither in the fields from lack of men to tend them. Its strength was not drained by forced marches to futile skirmishes. In the Vale, life proceeds as it always has. Calm, proud. A world of high honor undisturbed by seen armies that for a and men of low birth, vale. but high ambition. Impregnable. Impregnable really seems to be the theme, at least from Peter's eyes. Yeah, will be. I think that'll. I think that'll foreshadow a lot of. Because season four, I imagine we'll see him there, whatever his duties are there. Yeah. And. Well, he's. I think meant to get married to Liza. So. Oh right. I think that was the whole point, and that means he'll get hold of the Riverlands and also the Eyrie. Damn, dude, that'll be a huge. Wow, I wonder how long Peter Baelish is going to live. All, all the bad manipulators, but I guess they're the ones that play the Game of Thrones well. They live. Isn't it funny that if that happens, Peter Baelish will be the stepfather of that little, like, nuisance of a kid? <laughs> mm. Yeah, true. That'd be interesting. But blood matters and, you know, arrogance. Of the isolation, isolation. We're saying arrogance. that the fool is just in thinking that blood matters. Yeah. Which also obviously underpins him because he doesn't come from any special noble family, but mm. he's climbing that ladder of chaos slowly, slowly. Yep. And we've got the North by Jon Snow. This will be interesting hearing Jon's voice and take. He's been through a lot, so. I know, damn. As a boy, looking out from my father's castle, I thought the sun could never set on the North. So vast did it seem. Part of me still does. 
The north is by far the largest of the seven kingdoms, and can fit the other six inside it. Wow. Not that the others care. Cold and damp. That's how the southerners see the north. Hmm. But without the cold, a man can't appreciate the fire in his hearth. Without the rain, Ooh, a man like can't that. appreciate the roof over his head. Yeah. Let the south have its snow, nice. flowers and affectations. We northerners have home. Mine was once like Winterfell, that. the ancient seat of my father's family, House Stark, who have ruled the north oh, since the first the men were once the fathers. kings of winter. Growing up, John's all I've got left, and Arya, sure but as far as the sons go. Stark, no matter how much blood I share with her true-born children, but where their name rules over the north, mine is the north. Snow. Mm. Yeah, land true. Stretches it's good. Look at it. Neck, a narrow land that divides from the rest of Westeros. Legend has it that the children of the forest flooded it in their war against the First Men. If that's true, every Northman owes them a debt of gratitude. The swamps of the Neck are as good as the Wall for keeping out unwelcome armies. And if the swamps don't deter you, the Cranach men should. Small, shy people who rarely leave those swamps. And who follow House Reed, the gatekeepers of the North, and among the most important and loyal bannermen of House Stark. Also a bit strange. <laughs> I heard their oath of fealty once as a child. It's like no other lords, ancient and dark. They swear by earth and water, by bronze and iron, and by ice and fire. Where House Reed holds the gate to the John's north, quite up. House Manderley holds the port, White Harbour. The closest thing to a southern city we have, governed by the closest thing to a southern family we have. Generations ago, the Manderleys were driven from the Reach, but the Starks gave them their land in return for fealty. Now White Harbour is the richest city of the north, and the Manderleys the richest family. Not in gold and silver like their southern counterparts, but in fish, grain, and trade. Okay. As for the other great northern houses, the Starks brought them into the fold during the Age of Heroes. A Stark wrestled an ironborn for Bear Island and gave it to the Mormons. A Stark granted a keep and land to a younger son, Carlon, in return for putting down a rebellion. So the Mormons are the family sigil. then grew up okay. into the Car Starks. That's right. Starks fought the wildlings and their kings beyond the wall beside the umbers of last time. Damn, time. dude. The Starks were great, and we see the worst part of them. Boltons. Back then, they were the bane of the North. A few were even rumored to wear their enemies' flayed skins as cloaks. Oh, so Bolton's were sort of like... They too bent the knee. And so House yeah. Stark became the kings in the North, but never forgot that they weren't the North. When Aegon mm. and his dragons landed on Westeros, the kings of the Rock and the Reach sent all their men to die to defend their crowns. Torrin Stark knelt. To spare his people the same fate, he placed duty above pride, just as my I brothers in the Night's Watch had done for thousands of years at the Wall. Many think of it as the end of the world, but it's not. I've seen how the land stretches much farther than any man knows, into yeah. the land of always winter where the White Walkers came from during the long night. After the first men and the children of the forest beat them back, Brandon the Builder raised the wall and set up the Night's Watch to guard the realms of men. He gave us our oath, our castles and the gift, the lands behind the wall whose farmers and crops sustain us. Southerners may now mock my black brothers as thieves, rapers and worse, and not without cause. He's very proud of for his people. North remembers why we are there, and if mm. we fall, the South will get a very harsh... Yeah. Oh. Very cold reminder. Oh, I like that. The North remembers. The North remembers why they are there. For sure. Honestly, I, I have. I feel like I've got an extra soft spot for John now. I always liked him a lot, but I feel like he is all that's left of Rob and Ned in mm. him. Like, Arya also carries that, but she's a bit her own person. It's still very she's young. She's still young, yeah. But... John really is like what's he was very you know Rob loved him he was a brother Ned loved him and he carries I think a lot of the best parts of them yeah but also having experienced what he's experiencing he's like he may even be wiser 
he, I don't know. I, I, if I lose John too, I'll, that's it. I'll be, I'll be finished. But it's all I've got left. I do love his line of "I am the North." Snow. That's pretty badass. So regardless of not being like a Stark in like Catelyn's eyes and things like that, I am the North. Though, what a contradiction! Like, I know. You know, I am more than what you are. Like well, you're I, equivalent. I hope that's indicating some glory for him in the future. That'll mm. be cool. If he becomes the North. Oh, that will be fantastic. Oh, John. Um, so yeah, we've got a lot of big houses that we haven't really seen, like Mandalise, I think it was, and things like that. And then we've heard a couple times Bear Island, which is the Mormons. We haven't but seen them though, have we at all? The Mormons, other than Joa and Jorah. Jorah. Yeah. Not that I remember anyways. But then we've also got like lots of other houses that the Starks literally rose to glory, essentially, and made them big houses. And it seems like the Bolton sigil is actually that cross the with the- man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. what it is. Yeah. So that what that's what it, that's what a flayed man is, like, you know, out like that. Which I've, I've is, never heard that term before, but yeah. Yeah, which is crazy. And that's what I was saying before, like the what their punishments of like traitors and whatever is I guess their sigils in a way. So they should punish themselves with that way then. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. All right, the Riverlands by Brindon. Brendan? Brendan Tully? Do we know? I don't, that doesn't ring a bell. Bren, Brendan Tully. I don't know. I don't think we've met. I think they've mentioned it. Would that, is that the uncle by any chance? Remember? Oh, as in the... Um, Catelyn's uncle, The remember? Blackfish. Yeah. Is that his Maybe. name? Maybe. Because he was a Tully, I believe, but I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, no, he is a Tully. Yeah, but I don't remember his first name, so... I'm not sure. We'll soon find out. Men have fought over the Riverlands since the Dawn Age. Though that's to be expected of things that rest below the neck. Doesn't help that the Riverlands are between everything and everything else. The Westerlands gold, the Reaches grain, the Vale's rock, and the North's snow. It's a very powerful position. House Mud once ruled as the kings of the rivers and hills. But after a thousand years, their line was exhausted and fell to the Storm Kings, who fell to the Ironborn. I suppose after Two. years of drowning at sea, our rivers look pretty attractive to that race of pirates and rapers. Never mind that their monstrous castle, Harren Hall, was too large to staff and garrison. It turned out the Ironborn wouldn't be there long enough to bother. Aegon Targaryen landed to our south, and as had many before him, liked the look of the Riverlands. My ancestor Edmund Tully led the desertion of river lords to his cause and was rewarded by getting to watch King Harren burn in his own tower. It does sound like the uncle. that's not all Edmund got. House Tully was named the Lord's Paramount of the Trident, which means we had to keep in line all those lords who hadn't governed themselves for thousands of years. Wow. We were now responsible for aiding the Malisters at Seaguard against the pouting Ironborn whenever they got cheeky. For settling right. Harren Hall on families stupid enough to think its curse would skip them after devouring <laughs> all previous families. For keeping the Blackwoods and Brackens from wiping each other out and giving us two more castles to deal with. For keeping the Freys in their place and out of others' pockets. Damn oh, Freys. Damn Freys, dude. Sons and daughters wisely enough so we didn't follow House Mud into... Well... The mud. <laughs> Yet under the Targaryens, the Riverlands knew a peace we hadn't had for centuries, if ever. But like all good things, sooner or later it all goes to shit. And yeah. our shit had a name. There <laughs> is Targaryen. I think oh, that was everyone's shit. Had share of That's kids. hilarious. But usually they had the sense not to bully more than one powerful house at a time. Ares soon blundered into a triple alliance. The North, Stormlands, and Vale rose against him. But of course, where do you think most of the blood was spilled? Damn, my dude. brother Hoster guaranteed the answer to that with the marriage of my niece to Eddard Stark, the Warden of the North. Yeah. At least Hoster didn't send her to Robert. So, the Riverlands Damn. joined the war against the Mad King. And it was on one of our rivers that Prince Rhaegar died. Sealing the fate of his dynasty. 
Robert was a great soldier and a horrible king. Drinking and whoring are their own brand of madness when you sit on a throne. True, he did sort of let himself go a lot as king. He died, and another war started. Again the armies marched. Again the riverlands burned. If Westeros isn't careful, pretty soon our people will grow some sense and abandon this place for a safer realm. Yeah. Like the Dothraki Sea. Wow. I Ooh. joke, of course. Yeah, the I was gonna say. Our home, and God's uh. help us, we love it. Still, as they say, the king eats and the hand takes the shit. The same is true of the Riverlands. True. The seven kingdoms piss. And the Riverlands change clothes. Yeah, I love the way he talks. Mm. Is it Black Beach? Can you talk about the voice? I yeah, can't, it is. I it think, is. Yeah. And he said, like, his niece went and married. Yeah, that's right. Perfect. Yeah. yeah Damn. Really, I like his perspective. So the king's was an E and... The hand shits. The hand takes the shit. And then the Seven Kingdoms dr drinks or piss and the Riverlands change clothes. Yeah, damn. So essentially, it's just, you know, whatever's happening everywhere, they kind of take the brunt of it and they just got to, like, go with the flow is the way I'm taking it. Yep. Damn, crazy. Yeah, wow. It was nice hearing from him. Like, I, I miss his humor. And we don't see a lot of him in season three anyways. But just enough to know that, you know, he's there. I do hope, because he went to go take a piss when all this happened. So I'm hoping that he's going to come back with either John or Arya or someone by himself and bring vengeance. Yeah, true. I forgot about that. How how fortunate. What did he do? Like, what timing? Why could well, because I was getting excited. Bit? I was like, go see Arya, go see Arya. There's a bigger purpose there. Yep. Well, Brendan Tully's again talking about House Tully. Yep. So we've heard about House Tully from different perspectives. Now we've got Brendan. Yeah. Other houses chose dragons, krakens, and lions for their sigils. <laughs> we Tully's took the trout, the <laughs> most terrifying of fish, especially uh... when it leaps out of the water. I suppose you don't have many options when you live in the Riverlands. Mm. Could have been worse. We could have been minnows or wheat. After all, we make a lot of it. Though a land doesn't get as fertile as ours just by water. The old river kings, storm kings, and the kings of the rock spilled blood here for thousands of years, mm. squabbling like children over a new toy until the ironborn came and spanked them with their axes. Under Harren the Black, the their kingdom stretched all the That's way the to God's Eye, right? where they built the largest castle Westeros had ever seen. Maesters teach that Harren was a fool, but he had some sense. If you're going to enslave and torture an entire people, you best have thick walls to hide behind. True. But the very day the last stone was laid in Harren Hall, Aegon Targaryen landed How much in would you be spewing, dude? Dude, as imagine soon as that. Saw Aegon's host on the horizon. My ancestor Edmund led the mass desertion of river lords to Aegon's side. I doubt Harren even noticed. The problem with huge castles is they blind you to what's outside, both mm. by their size and the arrogance they inspire. Mm. Not but, that the it was ever lacked for that. They take pride in their ignorance of every trapping of civilization. Though any baker could have told them that fire turns stone walls into an <laughs> Any baker. And true. so Harren yeah. the Black finally lived up to his name, and the river lord <laughs> swept the ironborn back to the sea. In return for Edmund's service, House Tully was made Aegon's new lord paramount of the trident, and all the other lords had to swear us fealty. But old habits die hard. The Riverlands are and always have been the middle child of Westeros. Yeah. Caught up in every fart from one lord at another. My ancestors knew that for the Tullys to survive, alliances must be made. Our trout has swum up so many rivers over the centuries and leapt onto so many plates that it's a wonder half the realm's sigils don't have fins by now. Thus, yeah. every Tully child is taught family, duty, honor. Oh, no. The Tully words, 
and I can see why Tully's and Starks work well together. When I returned from the War of the <laughs> Ninepenny Kings, people called me Sir Brendan. But my older brother Hoster called me Engaged. A great oh. master with a very rich house, to be sure. But I just fought and killed a great deal of men and had no desire to be told when and whom to marry. Fair I enough. broke ties with him, earning the name Blackfish along with my oh. personal sigil. A much more intimidating yes. black trout. I was too stubborn at the time to realize that while other houses fight with swords, House Tully fights with marriages. Yeah. And my niece Catelyn's betrothal to Brandon Stark drew us into the war against the Mad King. While my other niece Lysa's betrothal to John Arryn cemented the rebellion. If I'd have obeyed my older brother earlier, we'd have had the largest navy in Westeros with us then as well, and our victory Damn. would have been swift. Wow. If I never mentioned this fact to my brother, he'd have taken it as an apology. <laughs> my brother is dead now. And my nephew Edmure rules in River Run. God's help us. A trout that can't tell the worm from the hook. But he is a tully, and he is unmarried, and there is a war. We all know how this story ends. Yeah. Maybe she'll be beautiful. Maybe she'll be rich. She was. As long as she beautiful. brings swords and men to house Tully, she could look like the fish we hang all over River Run. <laughs> He'll honor his duty to family. And swallow it. Yeah. One blackfish per family can be overlooked. Two, and we'd have That's to change story. all those pretty banners. Yeah. Wow. Well. I love the way he tells stories. It's like, really good. It's very like matter of fact. This is what I did wrong, but he also brings a like, humor to it. Yeah, I just really like it. But yeah, the Tullys are the middle child. Like they just get mutilated by all wars like coming to their land yeah and yeah, like he is, yeah and he is right like they literally do go like as he said in the little segment before it's kind of just going with the flurry like alliances 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 that's their strength all right now we've got the reach by marjorie tyrell so oh, yeah. the tyrells were kind of quiet the second half of season three yeah after, after elena lost that um debate or that not debate but that little squabble with Tywin. Tywin they've sort of been on the quiet end so I'm waiting for them to make a comeback yeah the reach is aptly named we're the ones who give your hands something to do at the table as the most mm. fertile region of the seven kingdoms we grow the lion's share of the grains and fruit that feed this country especially now since the rebels have burned <laughs> down the other fields. Thankfully, House Tyrell is here to do She's its duty to the crown and keep the capital from starvation. Yet, as with all gardens, weeds grow in the reach too, though few name them as such. Singers fill our heads with chivalry and courtly love, fluff to make boys fight and girls swoon. Mm. Oh, the songs are good Quite enough for pleasure barge down the Manda. They give pleasure to the common people and harmony to the realm. But if the rise of House Tyrell proves anything, it's that virtue and honor have their place. And if you're not careful, that place is the grave. Unlike Ooh, the Lannisters, true, true, Starks true. and Arryns, we were never kings in our own right. House Gardener ruled the Reach since the Dawn Age, and we were their stewards. While they warred to enrich their already rich domain, we managed their castle of Highgarden. But then Aegon Targaryen landed with his dragons. As he Nobody does. knows why the Gardener King took the field everything. against him. Anyone could see that a man who grows flowers should beware a man who grows fire-breathing monsters. Oh no. But maybe it wasn't true, true. really his idea. Maybe someone whispered in his ear about all the face he'd lose with the other six kings if the he were at home. Oh, wow. The rest is history. The last Gardener Such King lost climbers. his face along with his body and his steward Harlan Tyrell promptly yielded Highgarden to Aegon. My grandmother swears that Harlan was like most of our men and grew up banging steel together too loudly for a thought to penetrate. But luckily, his wife had better sense. 
Mm-hmm. Tyrell is a very like a woman, intelligent, so dominated cow. Aegon proclaimed House Tyrell the Lords of the Reach and Wardens of the South, passing over mm-hmm. all the other houses with better claims. Yeah, House damn. Hightower, who were kings before the Andals came. Their seat is the oldest city in Westeros. They call it Old Town. Wealthy, proud, and solitary. There have been high towers who wouldn't come down from their great lighthouse for decades. Its name, fittingly, is the High Tower. House Florent, who had actual blood ties to the gardeners. They whinge about their ancient rights to High Garden every <laughs> once in a while, <laughs> and now that their daughter is married to Stannis Baratheon, about their rights to all of Westeros too. Apparently, putting a fox on your banners doesn't impart a fox's wiles. House Tarly, who still gives the Reach the best soldiers it has. If Aegon had named them as his lords, the Reach would have become the greatest military camp in the world. Until it starved to death. The price for conscripting all the farmers. Yet Aegon chose us. Centuries later, when his descendant Ares faced rebellion, the Reach stayed loyal. Mostly. My father, Mace, yeah. dealt Robert his only defeat in the war, even if it yeah, was my right. father's vanguard who did most of the fighting before he arrived. After the Battle of Ashford, we laid siege to Storm's End, Robert's home. Unfortunately, the war ended before we could take it and they free were up smart our about it. Go save the king. The new <laughs> Very king smart. Robert go save the a forgiving king. nature. Our crimes were brushed aside without even one execution for the sake of formality. Our family Damn. was surprised until Robert's new hand, John Aaron, came by with the bill. The Reach is second only to the Westerlands in wealth, and Robert meant to spend as much of it as he could get his hands on. We gave him the coins he wanted, and later, mm. when he wanted our grain or fruit or wine, he gave them back at what ever price we set. Uh, now, much smart. of Westeros is ashes. The rest of it is armies. As the Starks are fond of saying, winter is coming, and for leagues outside the capital there isn't a harvest to be seen. Have no fear. The Reach is, as always, bountiful. House Tyrell will manage the harvest and keep the Seven Kingdoms from starvation like the good stewards we once were. Yeah, of Just course they garden. will. <laughs> Dude, is that foreshadowing anything too? Dude. Just ask House Gardener, like, because they're sort of playing this slow game with the oh, yeah. with the Lannisters, so very interesting. But I saw this from that very first um, Histories in Law that they were mentioned in. Yeah, seeing it's one thing, believing that they can actually fulfill on their promise, yeah. I'm believing it more and more as we go. Different, but... I, and I get that. I just, yeah, I just always saw them as ladder climbers. They'll take any opportunity, but they'll play both sides so well. And just even the way that they're well spoken. And uh, I mean, you you see it with Marjorie and Cersei's interactions. She's very particular, Marjorie, with the words that she uses. Like there's the reality, but then she kind of veers off here and says it in a different way, you know, less yeah. brutal. They sort of secretly moving the chess pieces no one even knows they're playing chess like it's yeah, very interesting yeah, yeah wonder, exactly exactly i like that and i wonder if i'd love to see marjorie oh, put it to uh cersei at some point Oof, that'd be great that's what i'm, I'm hoping for that well i mean even marrying joffrey is kind of a, like a stick it to to cersei yeah. as well oh there's so much at play very interesting so yes yeah, Stannis is married to a high tower Mm. Yeah. What other high tower do we know? I'm trying. I'm thinking of someone. Well, we know from House of the Dragon. That's yeah. right. That's where I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. So the high tower has had a much smaller role in this so far compared to House of the Dragon. Yeah. Well. Wow. Mm. Okay. Well, it's like they're slowly rebuilding. I mean, I don't know how House of the Dragon ends, but I would assume maybe not, not so great. great. By the house. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we got a House Frey again by Catelyn Stark. The irony. Oh, the here irony. We go. In that. Some houses rise to power through strength, others through wealth. House Frey gained its title through cunning. Oh, Centuries yeah. ago, Beats them its founder looked at a map and noticed how the trident spears the neck, cutting off the north from the south. Ooh. He realized that a river of gold would flow to the man who owned the right bridge across the water. 
Mm, it took the phrase smart. three generations to complete their forefather's vision. A massive arch of smooth grey rock, wide enough for two wagons to pass abreast. Mm. When they were done, they built high curtain walls, deep moats and heavy gates to protect the approaches. And put up squat, ugly, formidable keeps on either bank. Very the ugly. Prince, commanding both road and river with arrow slits, murder holes and portcullises. The twins ensure that no one crosses without begging the Frey's leave and paying the Frey's toll. Oh. The plan worked. The family grew rich and powerful, exacting gold from lords, merchants, and poor farmers. But that wasn't enough, good was it? Given the number of Freys the bridge has to support, the current lord, oh. Walder Frey, Rob had broken the has seen over 90 name days and sired near as many children, true-born or otherwise. A shameful thing in any other lord, but Walder Frey possesses no shame. Yeah, a dangerous we know that. thing for any other lord, but Walder Frey has no concern for heirs or fear of their impatience. Perhaps Lord Frey thinks to outlast them all. Given the infighting he encourages among them, perhaps he will. Whatever the case, House Frey does nothing so well as survive. When the yeah, Ironborn damn. conquered and raised the Riverlands, <sighs> the Freys hid in their castle. When Aegon oh, and House Tully swept the Ironborn back to their islands, the Freys hid in their castle. When damn, my dude. ancestor demanded their allegiance Horrendous. as Aegon's new Lord Paramount of the Trident, the Freys bent the knee from their castle. Perhaps then huh. we should not have been surprised when my father, Lord Hoster Tully, called his banners against the Mad King and Lord Walder didn't answer. The <laughs> Baratheons, Starks, Aarons, and Tullys, some of the oldest and greatest houses of Westeros, fought and bled for the cause of justice, while House Frey hid in its castle and waited. Did in his right, castle. No night, doubt if Rhaegar had one at the Trident, Lord Walder would have given him safe passage into the north to destroy the rest of my husband's northern army for a fair price. But Rhaegar fell, and lo and behold, the Frey army appeared to render aid to our already victorious forces. Many sniggered that Lord Walder had been waiting for his army to come of age, having fielded it out of his own britches. My own father named him the late Lord Frey, to the other lords mm. amusement. <laughs> a slight that pricks Lord Walder to this day. In yeah, many ways, however, Lord Walder was wise. We had no guarantee of victory, and had he fought with us from the outset and we failed, he would have lost the bridge his family was so proud of. I don't care. More pride than honor. Those should be yeah, the words definitely. of House Frey. <laughs> but part of me wonders if Lord Walder waited not out of fear but hope that we would be destroyed, leaving him to assume my family's Very place as Lord maybe. Paramount of the Trident. To buy the respect they've always wanted, but refused to earn. No. Not even Lord Waldo could be so disloyal. Oh. Oh. Yes, he can. Well, he essentially did that. Like, he essentially now is, you know, runs the Riverlands, like the Tully. Like, he killed Catelyn. He's got the North, like. Well, it does make sense now why they, of all houses, were going to be the ones to do something as significant as kill people that were guests, which is like, you know. No just, shame. Well, it just does, does not happen. It's like the, one of the worst acts that you could do in those times. So it makes sense. And Tywin obviously knew his reputation. I thought if any man's going to take this bribe and do something so dishonorable, it's going to be this snake. But literally, Catelyn was right. More pride than honor. Their pride literally got them to kill Rob, Catelyn, and Talisa. Oh, you're creeping on the top of my hate list. Disgusting. Cunning. Cunning is a really good word. Sneaky snake. Cunning. <sighs> you're right there? No. You're about to blow a fuse. The fuse is about to be blown. So we've got Tywin talking to us about the Westerlands. Tywin's always got a very interesting take on things too, so mm. it's interesting. The Westerlands are all bounded by three natural defenses. Mountain, sea, and forest. 
Necessary barriers when the land is as rich as ours. From our mines come the gold and silver that fuel the rest of Westeros. From Lannisport, our largest city, come the most skillful gold and silversmiths in the land. Yet geography alone is not strength. The Westerlands sure. would have been sacked and pillaged for thousands of years if it hadn't been for the men who ruled it. My family, House <laughs> Lannister. <laughs> the pride. According to legend, we trace our descent to Lan the Clever, a trickster of the Dawn Age, who swindled the Casterlies out of Casterly Rock, their ancient <laughs> castle. A childish story, but not without merit. One, a mind can and should be a weapon in a man's arsenal. Mm, Two, true. Lan must have been clever enough not to rely solely on his wits. After all, where today is House Casterly? Three, by True. keeping the casterly name on the castle, Lan reminded the world of the price of getting in his way. Mm. The Reigns ignored all these lessons. Not content with being the second richest family, they sought to challenge the first, mine. My father oh. had put up with their insults and disrespect. When I came of age, I led our army to teach them what they should have known. Very Tywin of him. Say I was too harsh that eradicating every member of their family was not necessary. Yeah, he had more <laughs> Now, there are no bannermen as loyal to their lord as the Westerlands to us. Mm. If any lord bridles at our authority, I have only to send a singer with a harp, and he falls <laughs> back into line. Damn. Because that I will not have true. our lords squabble amongst themselves, like the lords of the Riverlands, or hide in their castles like the lords of the Vale, each of our bannermen contributes a unique skill that furthers the whole of the Westerlands. Ask the game, because every lord needs a beast from time to time. Sir Gregor oh, yeah. strikes terror into the hearts of our enemies and our friends. So too does his disappointing brother Sander, the traitor. Not disappointing, House Payne, who provides us loyal servants. Sir Illin Payne was once captain of my household guard, until the Mad King heard him boast that I ran the Seven Kingdoms. Beheaded name. Which I did. The Mad King tore out Sir Illin's tongue, making him especially well suited to later become the King's Justice. Apparently, these days, a younger Payne also serves my degenerate son, Tyrion. <laughs> House Leffer, oh, who guards the golden like that, tooth. The eastern pass through the mountains and the all too frequent chaos of the Seven Kingdoms. Though after Rob Stark's recent incursions, perhaps we need a new gatekeeper. Fools look at the Westerlands and see gold. Fools see our wealth and call it strength. Gold mm, yeah. is just another rock. The Westerlands are strong because of House Lannister. From strong leadership very proud about comes his unity. From unity comes power. Wow. He knows well, how to play the Game of Thrones. Oh, for sure. And he very much said it where a man's um, mind, need, like a good mind needs to be in their arsenal, but that's not all you need. And that last line literally showed it. Like, good leadership is unity unity is power so that's another little uh quip on power and what he yeah. sees as power. he's a very macro scale leader he does look at the bigger picture and he doesn't underestimate his opponents yeah very often and sometimes he does things that are arguably too harsh mm. in sh short-term view but potentially create more peace in the long term more peace and stability in the long term so he's an interesting leader i'll, I'll give him that and he's definitely very successful so especially in this kind of world he, unfortunately, is probably one of the best leaders there is. Yeah. I, I do like him, but not his house as much. Yeah. You know, I, I do respect him because he is a very logical person. And he does, like, he doesn't just use one of his strengths. He has multiple strengths. And you can see that, you know, he was walking all over. He, he didn't respect his father. Like, like he said, his father just let the abuse come rolling in. Whereas once he came into power and of age, 
he really showed the strength of the Lannisters and became the Lannisters what they are today. Unfortunately, that means creating an alliance with the Freys and the Boltons and <sighs> betraying my Rob, my man Rob Stark and Talisa and Catelyn. So I hate him for that, but like you, I can't deny what a good leader he is, unfortunately. Yeah. All right, so we have the Red Keep by Joffrey. Now we have been warned by our mods at around the 59 minute mark. There's a 20 second has the Dragon spoiler, so we will be just flicking the mouse regularly through this to keep an eye on the time code to know where to skip that 20 second bit. Yeah. You guys will see it. Because we definitely don't want any spoilers. I mean, we've come all this way no Game of Thrones spoilers, no House of the Dragon spoilers. I think we want to keep it that way. Yeah, and our mod team's doing an amazing job, so shout out to oh, them. Shout out to you guys. Let's go. Oh, this voice I know is going to piss me Ugh. off. Mine. Ugh. That's what the Red Keep is. Yuck. Say mine. Small folks say its colour comes from the blood Aegon spilled to win his crown. <laughs> Fools. <laughs> blood Fools. doesn't Shut soak up. into stone. No matter how hard I try. It's got no Aegon nothing, built dude. his castle of red rock to remind people of the fires he'd roasted his enemies in. So whenever King's Landing locked up, they'd see the price of defiance. He knew the first rule of King's. Only fear keeps men in line. Fear and punishment. A lesson he taught his son, Maegor. When the Builders finally finished the Red Keep, Maegor executed them all to keep its secrets safe. Jesus, Rumor man. has it. Miles of hidden passages run thing. behind the walls and under the floors. One day I'll have to find them. Ugh. Traitors and women work in shadows. A king has no need for secrecy. <laughs> now, people name Magor the Cruel, but I doubt any dared in his day. His strength was all too rare in the degenerate Targaryen blood. He's trying to like shatter this guy. Blessed created the Maiden Vault to imprison his own sisters and save himself from carnal thoughts. Disgusting. Though I admit a prince fault could be amusing when Tommen bores me. My favorite place in the Red Keep? His brother. There's so many. Dude, this guy is The traitor's whack. walk, where I mount the heads of my enemies. It's a shame flesh rots so slowly. Oh I my god. The, the dungeons are also quite nice once you get past the first two Jesus. levels. A stable for common criminals and private cells for useful highborns. How boring, I know. But then you come to the black cells. No windows. Oh, that's when Ned was. No torches. Just darkness. And whatever you hear in there with you. I love how he glorifies there it, but he wouldn't last a minute in it. Traitors until the king is ready for them. And with these, I often like to take my time. The king is ready but for I've them. I've heard rumors of an even lower, hidden level. Magor's favorite. Once a man was taken here, he never saw the sun again, nor heard a human voice, nor breathed oh a breath God. free of agonizing pain. Varys must know the way, but that overgrown girl pretends not to. Maybe he fears I'll make him a victim. Maybe I will. That's disgusting. It's okay. Horrendous. I'm pretty sure this is where yeah, we have is. to skip. I would have so... waited three seconds, but sure. <laughs> I can put the three seconds on if you That's like. Fine. Skip to 59.20. With a dragon. Even Ares, fool as he was, knew to burn men alive with an audience to spread the terror far and wide across his kingdoms. Of course, I know my favorite place now. When I sit on the Iron Throne, high in the Red Keep, all of Westeros scuttles for. below me, like insects, waiting oh my for my heel to land. Is this guy gonna shut up now? Disgusting. No matter how hard I try, blood doesn't soak into stone. No matter how hard I try, disgust. Honestly. Well, we know. We know that he's got a really perverse sense of pleasure. I can't wait till, I hope, the biggest injustice in Game of Thrones, bigger than anything we've seen so far, 
will be if Joffrey never gets his due. If he somehow never cops, like, worse than what he's done to people, then that'll be, be my biggest gripe with the whole series. I want a White Walker or a dragon to come for him. Oh, or something to just annihilate him. That'd be fantastic. Oh, that would be freaking fantastic. Oh, if Arya or Sansa gets the day with him, oh, I would love that. Love so that. Good. When you're looking up to the Mad King, got a few screws loose in there. Yep. So that was painful listening to Joffrey's voice. His voice is disgusting. I'm just like, oh, like, just get off it. Like, you're, you're just, ugh, I don't like him at all. Uh, the, you know what the thing is? The hate list, oh, I feel like it has to grow after season three because Joffrey definitely needs to stay on there. But I've got a few others that need to be on there after that betrayal with Rob. <laughs> You've got a burning race through you this other yeah. recording, don't you? <laughs> All right. I think this may be the last one. I'm not sure, but there's about four, three and a half minutes. So I'm thinking it's maybe the last one. Uh, the Lord of Light by Thoros. So this will be interesting. Mm. A bit about Lord of Light to wrap it up. Thoros is that priest. I'm yeah, the one sure. that brings the other one back to life. Beric Dendarian. That's his name. I was born youngest of eight in Mere across the narrow sea. So my father gave me over to the Red Temple. In their wisdom, they decided to make me a priest instead of a <laughs> warrior or a temple prostitute like other children. It was not the path I would have chosen. Sure, I prayed the prayers and I spoke the spells, but I also led raids on the kitchens. And from time to time, they found girls in my bed. Such wicked girls. I never knew how they got there. No, then again, never. I did have a gift for tongues. And when I gazed into the flames, well, from time to time, I saw things. Even so, I was more bother than I was worth. When the High Priest foresaw Robert's ascension, he sent me to turn the Storm Lord to the Lord of Light. When Robert seized his crown, we'd take all of Westeros from the Seven in a single stroke. Perhaps mm. they thought oh. Robert would listen to a kindred spirit, or perhaps celibacy had addled the High Priest's brain. I didn't know and didn't care. <gasps> I was free yeah. yeah i did my duty as i saw it drinking and whoring and waving my sword <laughs> around the any gods robert cared about anyway true years <laughs> passed true. robert became king i became a joke we both became fat i even won some <laughs> glory in Greyjoy's rebellion first through the breach and all that <laughs> it's amazing what boldness of full bladder can inspire <laughs> but Robert had stopped listening to my sermons a long time ago, even if I'd still bothered to give them. Then came Robert's death and the war. I'm not speaking of those brats squabbling over the world's pointiest chair. Powers <laughs> long asleep are waking and moving through the land. Okay, so they know the I've seen them picture. in the flames. Yeah, Shit, yeah. I've seen them with my own two eyes. The Lord of Light is real. And if he's real, then all of it is real. Yeah. Man once again faces the war for the dawn. Okay, that's when which you has realize. Been waged since time began. On one side is the Lord of Light, the Heart of Fire, the God of Flame and Shadow. Mm. Against him stands the Great Other, whose name may not be spoken. The Lord of Darkness, what the Soul walkers? of Ice, the God of Night and Terror. According to prophecy, our champion will be reborn. To wake dragons from stone and reforge the great sword Lightbringer that defeated the Dark that mean that thousands of years ago. If the old tales are true, a terrible a weapon forged with the lifeblood of a loving wife's heart. Part of me thinks man was well rid of it, but great power requires great sacrifice. That mm. much, at least, the Lord of Light is clear on. Yeah, I I that old woman I know. But as our former hand liked to say. Winter is coming. When the cold winds rise, all men, no matter their faith or lack of it, huddle beside my night fires. And I pray the prayers, and speak the spells, and beseech yeah. the Lord of Light to bring back the dawn. So far, so good. But reprobate as I am, I can't help but wonder what will happen if, one day, our Lord does not answer. Imagine a night that goes on forever, so dark wow. and full of terrors. I think I need another drink. <laughs> Me too, my love. Me too. And now I know why they like uh, Stannis, because the night is dark and full of terrors. 
Yeah, but imagine that. Imagine their Lord doesn't answer. I mean, so far he's been answering, bringing Beric Dondarrion back to life. Like, was it five or six times or something like that? Yeah. Which is a lot. That really foreshadows the potential of what's coming. Just the greater, the greater battle that's really there and how, you know, how minuscule what's currently going on sort of mm. is in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. So I wonder, it sounds like Danny has the potential to be that champion. It'll be interesting because her whole birthright is, in her mind, is to claim the Iron Throne. The Iron Throne, but perhaps she'll rise to much, much more. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Like, I wonder if we're going to see you, because, you know, Beric Dendarian. He always said that every time he got brought back to life, he loses a piece of himself. I wonder if we actually really get to see what that looks like for him, but also what that means for other people. Like, I can't, I can't imagine, like, I don't know, like, why him? Why is the Lord of Light bringing him back all the time? He always said he was good with his tongue. So who knows? Good with his tongue, as in he's, well, he's very good with his wording, so his prayers might be different. There's obviously a few select few, Melisandre mm-hmm. as well, who are able to respond and achieve and get power from the Lord of Light for various reasons. Yeah. But that's so funny. Like, Thoros and Robert, what a horrible duo. Um, them two, like, ruling yeah. over everyone. Yeah. Both neglect a lot of their responsibility. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Damn, I actually really enjoyed this one. Like... Season three, like, we got a lot of different stories, a lot of background on different things. And we got to hear from people that, you know, we haven't specifically heard from before. Yeah, well, I was going to say it's probably the strongest one yet. But then I'm thinking about it. Honestly, it could just be that we're a lot more familiar with the law. Yeah. So, obviously, as we got, I haven't found this one the least tiring of the three mm. to engage and stay in tune with. And probably because I'm a lot more familiar with a lot of the stories. So, yeah. I thought... It's easier to more. keep up. Yeah, and I could absorb a lot more. Whereas the first one, for example, I remember just being a lot to probably a lot went over my head. So it was, it was interesting. And we're at a point in the series now where we've got enough familiarity uh, and connection to the stakes and what's mm. happening in the different houses and different wars and the potential future outcomes. And so now it's sort of like almost giving us potential different roads the story can take and there's more connection to all of those uh, options. What was your favorite story to hear? Do you have one? I don't know. That's, that's a very hard question. Yeah. You're better, maybe if you got, you sound like you've got one, but for me, that's hard to answer. I think I loved, it wasn't particularly the story that I liked listening to. It was who was saying it. And it was very much Varys and Peter Baelish together. That was like, I don't know, like it came to life from the show as well. Like, well, that's a very different, different question. You sort of changed your question there, which then I would agree. Who did I enjoy listening to the most yeah. versus the actual story itself? Mm-hmm. That they were, they were definitely very interesting. Although Blackfish and Tywin also yeah. very close seconds. I like the way they Blackfish was good. I like Blackfish. But- and the Tyrells was also a very good one. I, mm. I feel like we got really good insight into the Tyrells. Actually, just a lot of families that are sort of up and coming that we don't know a lot about. Mm. This one, even the Freys and, and, and a few others, the Tullys. I, got, I feel like I absorbed the most and getting an idea on the houses and what they're sort of like. And I feel like that will be really beneficial come season four Mm. just to have a bit more familiarity with the characteristics that underpin a lot of these houses. Yeah. I mean, although I hate Joffrey and the way he speaks and like his perspective, dare I say the way he tells the stories, I think it's because of his character and his views. It is actually interesting listening to him say these horrific things. Sure, sure. But yeah. Well, guys, we hope you enjoyed our reaction and discussion to Histories and Law Season 3. As you can tell, we got a lot out of this one and we are looking forward to starting Season 4 and with a lot of knowledge and a lot of tragedy and just potential for, for more. People keep saying in the comments, the North remembers. And the that North gives remembers. me hope that at some stage, the North is going to get something back on the South because so far it's been horrendous before everyone potentially comes together for the bigger battle beyond the wall. I really need the North to get some points on the scoreboard because at the moment they are severely lacking. Yeah. But I'm very excited to see what awaits us in season four, which we've been told is another fantastic season. If you haven't already, remember to like the video. If you enjoyed our reaction today, let us know what you thought in the comments and hit that subscribe button so you know as soon as we drop the first episode of season four, which is going to be a whole new journey in and of itself. But yeah, do let us know in the comments um, if you do like this kind of content because 
you know, it will give us an indication of whether we keep doing this or not. So yeah, please do let us know. We'll see you guys on the next reaction. Until then, take care of yourselves. See you guys.